Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here, and uh, thank you for giving us your time. As I say, my name's Pete Bullimore. I'm a voice hearer. I'm not just a voice hearer. I am proud to say I'm a voice hearer. They're my experiences, and I own them. I spent over 10 years in the psychiatric system, often forcibly detained under the Mental Health Act. When I first went into the system, I was told by a consultant psychiatrist, he said, Mr Bullimore, you are a chronic schizophrenic, you will never, ever work again, go away and enjoy your life. I think, how does that actually work? But I'm now out of the mental health system. I've thrown my diagnosis away because I don't believe in the concept of schizophrenia. Because there never has and there never will be any scientific validity for that diagnosis. I'm quite happy to say that I'm a voice hearer. But I'm part of the Hearing Voices movement. I also run an organisation called Asylum Associates, which offers training, consultancy, and we set up conferences. And I'm the founder member of the Paranoia Network in this country. I do a lot of work with people, usually people that have been told that they can't recover. And I average 70 to, eight, 70 to 80 hours a week, travelling around the world, delivering teaching on hearing voices and paranoia and its relationship to childhood trauma. So it goes to show recovery is possible, as psychiatry can be wrong. Now, when I talk about psychiatry, I'm not just talking about psychiatry, I'm talking about every discipline that works under the banner psychiatry. That's nursing, OT, social work, psychology, support work, right across the board. So I've been doing this work for about 14 years now, and at times I still hear some members of staff describe a long-stay patient by saying, that person's lights went out years ago. Well, I can assure you, a person's lights never, ever go out. There's always something burning inside that person. And it is the role of mental health workers to reach beyond diagnosis, find that person and reignite that flame. And we do that by creating hope. To foster hopelessness by telling someone they may never work again makes that journey to recovery very, very difficult. Everybody's got the capacity to recover as long as we do not define recovery. Recovery is not defined by measured outcomes. Recovery is a personal journey. The person knows when that journey starts, they know when that journey finishes. Part of that journey is going back to services, but it's what you learn from those admissions. You learn more about yourself. They get shorter. So it is a very, very personal thing, and services have got to stop telling people how to recover, because it is a personal journey. So what I want, I haven't got a lot of time, so I want to take you on a, a journey into madness, and that is my madness. I'm going to talk about how I believe I became a voice series through childhood trauma. I'm going to talk about some of the time I spent in services in Sheffield. Now, I'm talking about Sheffield. It's not a generalisation of services. I'm just talking about what happened to me. I'm going to, I'm going to highlight some really, really good practice. But I'm also going to highlight some bad practice as well. But I think it's important we can learn from good and bad practice. That's the important thing. Well, from the age of five up to 13, I had a tormentor. You would probably call this woman an abuser. The reason I called her a tormentor was... She not only abused my body, she tormented my mind. My body healed, my mind didn't. She was a babysitter that would come round on a Friday evening, and at first everything was okay. Then after a while, she put a programme on called Appointment with Fear. I don't know if you remember, it was Dracula, Frankenstein, that kind of thing. And I was quite a nervous kid, and I said, I don't want to watch this. He said, well, tough, you've got to watch it. Then she turned the lights out and have to watch it in the dark. Now, abuse is all about power, and it's all about manipulation. And what she would do is she'd keep giving me glasses of pop. You know, at times kids can be greedy. I'd always drink them. Then after a while I'd say, I want to go to the toilet. She said, well, you can go, but you're not putting the lights on. So I'd be too frightened to go upstairs. Subsequently, I would wet myself. But when my parents came home, the television was off, the lights were on. And straight away she said, I told him to go to the toilet. He took the notice. Now, she's the adult. There's no reason not to believe her. And when someone's got you in a grip of fear, there's nothing they can't do. And that's when the abuse really started. It was sexual, it was physical, some of it was downright disgusting. Sometimes she'd bring friends along to join in, even to the point where she would get a silk scarf, tie it round my neck and hang me from the banister. As my eyes rolled, she would let me back down. The problem is, as you get older and the abuse escalates even more, you get very, very paranoid. I got very, very paranoid at a very young age. I thought all the world knew what was happening, but no one was prepared to help me. And it was a school holidays, and I used to isolate myself in my bedroom. And my mum would say, you can't stop in here all day, you're going to have to go out. So I'd go to a local park, and there was a putting green, and I'd get one golf club and two golf balls. And I was to play against something I could hear. 
It had no identity, no gender. It was just a voice. And that time I thought it was like an imaginary friend. But on, re on reflection, I was starting to hear voices. The problem is as you get older and the abuse intensifies even more, sometimes your body starts to respond. You're worried all week about what's going to happen, but some of those feelings are quite pleasurable. And that really screws your mind up. Why am I enjoying something that I don't want? And when this happened, the voices took a sinister turn. One became 10, 10 became 20, and it became very, very destructive. They told me to harm myself and to harm other people. And I was playing football with a friend of mine one day and I got all these voices in my head screaming, hit him, hit him, hit him. And I thought my head was gonna explode. So I did, I punched him in the face. He started to cry. I couldn't explain why I'd done it. So my mom smacked me around the ear all, she could hit kids in those days. And it got to the point where I was seen as being quite dysfunctional. We had an electric lawnmower. It was plugged in and my mom was cleaning the blades. And under the instructions of the voices, I turned it on and just missed cutting the fingers off. So all the time I'm getting a smack. Even to the point where I even turned a loaded crossbow on my dad under the instructions of the voices. Thought it someone stopped me. But I think the lowest point did prove to be a turning point came just before my 13th birthday. It was midweek and I was doing my homework. And this woman had come round and asked where I was. And my mum had said, oh, he's doing his homework. So I said, oh, go and give him hand. And she came upstairs and she had full sex with me on the bed. Now at school in those days, you did sex education, but you did very little on contraception. So I thought, what if she's pregnant? I'll get blamed for this, I get blamed for everything else. It obviously turned out she wasn't pregnant, but it also gave me the courage to say to my parents, I don't want this woman to come round anymore. I can look after myself. And they agreed. And the abuse stopped and the voices went away. The problem was I never told anybody about the abuse or the voices. From the age of 13 up to 17, I lived a so-called normal life. I left school and I started working in the steel industry. And then I met a young woman. She was my first love. I fell madly in love and we went out for a while. And then she became pregnant. Now all I'd done with this act was put myself back on a treadmill of pressure. We decided to get married, we bought a house and a son was born, and then we had a daughter. But I never told my wife about the abuse or the voices. And then the recession hit and I lost my job. And as much as I tried, I couldn't find work. My wife became pregnant again, we now got three children and very, very limited income. So we got to the point where the bills were mounting up, the house was threatened with repossession, so I decided somehow I got to make ends meet. But eventually I did find work and it was manufacturing fire surrounds. I was working seven days a week and making no impact on the money that we owed. And through the stress and the pressure, the voices started to return. It was a Friday evening, I'd just got my wages and I was walking through Sheffield Town Centre and I was hit with a real booming dominant voice. And this voice kept saying, you're Mickey McAvoy, you're worth millions. Now Mickey McAvoy was the guy that robbed the Brinks Mac Gold and I foolishly believed what this voice was telling me. So thinking I got millions of pounds with the gold stashed away, I walked into the first pub I found and bought everybody a drink. And then I bought them another one. So you can imagine the reaction when I went home with no money and I couldn't explain what had been happening. And for a period of months, things ebbed and flowed. The voices would be there, then they'd go away. And then a friend, friend of mine approached me and says, Pete, I've got some spare money. Would you like to go in business together? He says, you'll put the knowledge of fire surrounds in and I'll put the finance in. So we set up this business and in the first year we turned over a million pound. Now with that comes a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And we were working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And unbeknown to my wife, she became my tormentor. She loved the flash lifestyle she'd now got, but she wanted me at home as well because we got three young children. And I'd be out working late at night and she'd ring me up and say, you're a crap father, you're never at home, the kids never see you. So I felt like a woman was tormenting my mind again. It wasn't just that, the pressure of the business was now immense. And my behaviour started to spiral out of control. I got really, really paranoid. I don't know what the significance of a white car was. If a white car followed me for more than two streets, I'd turn the van across the road and I'd jump out and I'd be banging on the windscreen asking why they were following me. And family and friends started to approach me and they said, Pete, you're losing weight. You're looking stressed. You need to calm down. But I really thought I was Jack the Lad and could keep going. And I was driving home way late one night and I was driving down this small country lane. And if you've ever seen the film Nightmare on Elm Street with a Freddy Krueger guy, you'll know what I'm on about. And I looked in the mirror of the van and I could see this Freddy Krueger character in the back of the van. So I jumped out and I'm put, chucking all the packaging out the back of the van so it's all over the road. But then there's other cars that can't get past. They're blasting their own, shouting, get out at way. And I'm shouting, F off, I'm looking for Freddy Krueger. Breaking the aerials <laughs> off and throwing them at the cars. <laughs> then I pack everything up, I'd go 100 yards and I'd do it again. It was slowly encompassing my life. And then I was at work one day and my wife rang me. She says, Pete, you've probably not realised, but the kids are at school full time. I want something to do. 
So we've got this, this big house, plenty of money, plenty of space. Why don't we foster a child? And I always remember thinking, why don't you get a job like everybody else? You have to keep carts on wheels at times. And she arranged for a social worker to come and see us. And what should have took me 30 minutes to drive home, took me three hours. Because if I saw someone I thought I knew, I'd drive in a different direction. I was getting really fearful of society. I eventually got home and this social worker was still there. And I'll never forget this lady. She was an elderly lady about this big. She had a red coat on and a black beret. And she was in the front room. And as I walked into the front room, I was hit with more voices than I'd ever heard before. And he kept saying, that's a man dressed up in a French spy. You should get him out of here. So I turned and walked out and my wife said, what's wrong with you? I said, that's a man dressed up in a French spy. Get rid of him. So she asked this lady to leave. But as she was leaving, she said to my wife, why do you want me to leave? You've invited me here. And my wife says, well, my husband thinks you're a man and a French spy. So you can imagine we can't foster kids after comments like that. And my wife said, there's something wrong with you. We need to get some help. So I went to see my GP and I tried to explain what was happening. And he says, you just stress, Pete. Take these beta blockers, you'll be fine. So I went with these beta blockers and I'd had a terrible, terrible period of insomnia. I'd not slept properly uh, for days. And it was the early hours of Sunday, Sunday morning. I was laid on the settee in the front room and I had an out-of-body experience. I was up here, I was seeing myself laid on the settee and at that point I thought I'd died and I couldn't get back in my body. I eventually got back in and I started to cry uncontrollably, which is something I learned as a child you don't do because it's a sign of weakness. And I went to bed and my wife asked me what was wrong. But all I could say to her was, why have you let me die on my own after all I've done for you? She couldn't understand what I was saying. She says, Pete, you've got to get some help. And I got up the next day and I said to her, does my head look swollen? I think it's going to explode. She says, no, Pete, please don't go to work. But I ignored her and I went to work and there'd been a problem on a job. And this man was really shouting down the phone. And I said to him, look, don't worry, we'll sort it out. But he went on and on and on. So eventually I said, oh, F off and slammed the phone down. And my business partner says, Pete, you can't speak to people like that in business. Now, that's all he said. So I ate him over the head with the telephone and then drove home. And that's where I stopped for three weeks. I didn't wash, I didn't shave, I hardly ate or drank anything. I was just locked in this world of voices and paranoia. And eventually the doctor came and he says, Pete, I think you should go in hospital. Now, I was ignorant to mental health. Believe you me, I was ignorant. So I thought he was going to put me on a general ward. I thought, nurse is fussing around for a few weeks, I can cope with that. So this wet November night, my dad drove me up to the local psychiatric unit and I actually said to him when we got there, why have you brought me here? It's full of nutters. He said, well, this is where you've got to go. And he took me on this ward and it was a real eye-opening experience. It was absolutely filthy. There were double mattresses on single beds, people laid on the corridors, it was a pit. And I was put in an observation room and eventually this female doctor came to see me and asked me what was wrong. And I tried to explain and she said, I'm going to start by giving you a rectal examination. I don't know why they wanted to do that. I thought they got me there to be abused again. So I decided to run away. I was running down the corridor and I was stopped by a male nurse and he said, you can leave, but if you leave, we'll section you. That's illegal. That's coercion. But not knowing that at the time, I decided to stay. And my behaviour did spiral out of control and I was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And over a period of 10 years, I spent a lot of time on different sections. But during the first admission, I wouldn't look in a mirror. I said, I can't see myself. All I can see is a demon. This demon had long hair, it had a beard, and it was black round the eyes. But on reflection, that was me. Nobody encouraged me to get a shave, a haircut, and I was taking a combination of 25 drugs a day, I'd just gone black round the eyes. And in there, time is of no consequence. And eventually, after about six months, I said to my worker, I want to go home. He said, it's ward round today, Pete. Sit at the end of the ward, and I'll get you in to see the doctor. So, nine o'clock, I'm sat at the end of the ward. Six o'clock, I'm still sat at the end of the ward. I had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, not had a pee. And eventually I said, when am I seeing the doctor? He says, sorry, Pete, I totally forgot about you. So it really wound the voices up. And the following week, he did exactly the same thing again, left me sat there all day. So eventually, when I got on ward round, I learnt the golden rule of getting out of a psychiatric unit. Tell lies, that's the best way to get out. And I managed to lie my way out. But as I was leaving, my wife and my parents said, what's wrong with him? They said, it's confidential, ask Peter. Well, I couldn't tell him anything because nobody had told me anything. And I went home, but I was asleep with the light on, because we have night terrors, it's the most frightening thing you'll go through. And this one evening, my wife had turned the light out, and I had this night terror, and I jumped up screaming. She went to comfort me, but I couldn't see her, I could only see what had been in this night terror. And I jumped on and started to strangle her. Now, fortunately for her, and fortunately for me, she threw me off and went and locked herself in the front room downstairs. But that left me and three young children upstairs in a very disturbed state. Now, I'm glad to say I never went anywhere near the kids, all I got from that was resectioned. But had they been honest with her and told her what I was telling them, 
He should have said, I don't want him home yet because there's a risk. So I think where family members and carers are concerned, the confidentiality rules got to be addressed because it's far too one-sided. Over a period of years, I spent a lot of different time on even more sections. But I was very fortunate at one point, I got um, a phone call and, uh, from my wife. And she said, I'm just ringing you to tell you I've got a social worker, which baffled me because I no longer had one. But he turned out to be a really nice guy. And he said to me one day, did you know there's a hearing voices group at Sheffield Mind? So I says, no. She says, do you want to go? So I says, no. We kept encouraging me to go to this group. Now I'd become the archetypical schizophrenic. I didn't wash, I didn't shave, I was scruffy. And I went to this group one day and there was 10 other people there. And it could have been any one of you sat at that group that day. And the reason I say that is they were all smart and presentable. I remember thinking, this can't be schizo, she'll be scruffy like me. And they started to talk about their experiences. And at last I thought, this is where I belong. I can take this mask off I've been wearing for years. Because my family had said, don't tell anybody what's wrong with you. I'm continuing in and out of services. You're continually living a lie. I was then very fortunate that I got a new worker called Sally. And Sally was an occupational therapist. And the great thing about Sally was she never, ever treat my diagnosis. She looked beyond it for the person. Now, there's a massive feeling of oppression in psychiatric care. I'm not saying it's what workers create, but when you're in services, your confidence and your self-esteem is here and you see everybody else up there. And you've got to address that balance of power. And the way she did it for me was, she just told me a little bit about herself, what stresses and traumas she'd had. And at last I thought, this woman does understand. Because quite often I'd seen workers as being robotic, not having feelings and emotions. I then got a really good new psychiatrist called Paul. And the great thing about Paul was, he had an open door policy. He would say, if you want to see me, knock on my door, come in. You don't need an appointment. And he started to cut me drugs, so things started to pick up. So I continued to go to this voices group, and Sally was really, really supportive. But eventually, I decided to evaluate my own life. Because I'd gone to this voices group, and they said, why don't you go to a, this hearing voices workshop? Come along and we'll go. Now, I got there at St. Matthew's Church Hall, and I thought, well, where's the benches? What are we going to make? I didn't think it was there. I didn't know what a workshop was. The three people from the Hearing Voices Network came in and they told their narratives of recovery. And what really struck me was content of voices related to life experience. And I suddenly thought, perhaps there's another explanation for all this. I was still on really heavy drugs and couldn't do anything about it, but a seed had been sown that this organisation existed. I said, then I decided to evaluate my own life. I was trying to make sense of this crazy world I was living in. I looked when I was at my own business, I had nine people working for me on the shop floor. I hadn't seen any of them. So I thought, perhaps they're my disciples, they've all betrayed me. I had an out-of-body experience, so I've died and resurrected. I've been on the acute wards, so I've been to hell and back. It fits, I must be Jesus Christ. And we always say, you're not a fully paid member of the psychotic society unless you've been Jesus. So, <laughs> 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 so with this newfound information, what shall I do? I thought... I'll go to Sheffield Cathedral, I'll go and show myself. So I made my way there in my scruffy state. And as I got to the big wooden doors, I thought, oh shit, they crucified Christ. I must have a last supper. So I went to McDonald's and got this sausage and egg McMuffin, contemplating my crucifixion. Then I went back across and as I walked in, a man stopped me and says, what do you want? I said, I've come to see the main man, I've come to show myself. And he sat talking to me for about 10 minutes. He didn't really listen, really listen to what I was saying. But then he foolishly left me. Now, I've never been in the cathedral since. There was a pulpit here facing the main auditorium, but there was one side on. And there was a vicar side on doing a sermon to some old age pensioners. So I seized my chance. I ran down the cathedral and never saw me coming. And I just jumped in the pulpit and he went, Christ almighty. I thought, well, fantastic, he's recognised me. <laughs> so we had to stop the whole sermon. And he took me in this back room and he says, what are you playing at? And I said, well, you thought, I thought you recognised me. And we had this long drawn out conversation, which finished up with him saying, have you ever been in a mental hospital? Well, a few times, what's that got to do with anything? And he says, I'm starting a group for people with mental health problems in September, would you like to come? And he took all my details, and I'm not really sure which September he meant, because I've never heard from him since. So I am quite disillusioned I wasn't a messiah. But Sally had this great ability to see when I was drifting. And she'd just bring me back on side. I then got a phone call from Paul, the psychiatrist. He says, Pete, I want you to come and see me. So I went to see him, and he said, look, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to cut your drugs by 50%. To see how you function. And it felt great. My arms and legs felt part of my torso again. 
but also searching for meaning and understanding what all this crazy world is going on. And again, I tried to evaluate my own life. I looked at the child sexual abuse, loss of my family, loss of my business. I've been told I'll never have a future. So perhaps I was born to kill myself. It's preordained, this is my destiny. I thought before I kill myself, I'll go and tell Paul the psychiatrist, which is imagine not a very wise move. So I went to see him and I said, Paul, I've worked it out. So he said, come on then, what is it today? Now Paul's consulting room was very small. Now, when you've taken volumes of medication over years, you forget words and you get thought blocking. And I said to him, Paul, I was born to kill. And for life, me couldn't think of the word myself. So I continually saying, Paul, I was born to kill. And you've never seen a chair go to that back wall as fast in all your life. <laughs> and he, he doubled my medication, sectioned me and went to work in a different trust. But <laughs> I've still got a lot of high regard for that man. He did a lot for me. But then you see the other ends of the scale. When I was resectioned, I got a new psychiatrist called Fernandez. It was an absolute nightmare. She hated me with a vengeance. If I looked at her, my drugs went up. I thought, don't smile, I'll be on lithium on top of everything else. And it got to a point where my parents had to bring in tea towels for bibs for the slaver coming out of my mouth. My legs would be bouncing on the bed. And I said, look, can't you tie me down so I can sleep? But obviously, you can't. And again, time has no consequence. And eventually, a nurse said, Pete, Dr. Fernandez wants you. So I went to see her and I said, when am I going home? She said, you're not. So I asked her why. She said, because you don't speak to people. You don't speak to staff, you don't speak to patients, all you do is lay on your bed all day. So I've got nothing to say. So look, if you don't start speaking to people, I will never, ever let you out of here. So I thought, on them sobering thoughts, I better, words, I better start to speaking to someone. So I started telling my name nurse what the voice has said. And when I got on ward round, the same consultant says, we can't let you go, you're too delusional what you're telling the staff. So I'd shot myself in the foot. But eventually I managed to lie my way out again. And my mum used to ring me every day, and one day she didn't ring. So I went to visit her, but she wasn't there. There's was only my dad there. He says, your mum's in hospital, she's collapsed with severe back pains. And we're testing her for kidney stones and various things. So I went to the hospital and I sat at the side of the bed and I was bombarded with voices saying, your mum's got cancer, she will be dead in six months. And it was over and over again. And my mum was diagnosed as having cancer of the pancreas. She got moved to a cancer unit where she became very unwell. And I was to stop there with my dad and eventually said, you're gonna have to go home. It's not looking good for your mum and it's taking its toll on you. So I went home and I started to sleep in the front room so I could be near the telephone. And at five to seven this one morning, I was woken by what I always describe as the angel of death. It was a horrible brown stinking bird. It was there for seconds and then it went. And at seven o'clock, my dad rang and said, your mum's just died. And that was six months to the day I was told she would die. Now I couldn't put that down now to coincidence. But at that time, it really screwed my mind. I and mean, the voices loved it. You're a murderer. You've killed your mother. Burning hell. Can you imagine the vile language that went with it? It was really incessant. And I went to the funeral. There was 200 people at the funeral. The only person that never shed a tear was me because my emotions were blunted with drugs. And again, the voices loved it. You're a murderer. It proves it. You're not crying. It really, oh, it was over the top now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I stopped with my dad for a while. Then I decided to go back home. But as I was going home, the voices convinced me that my flat was possessed with demons and I could only survive if I lived in the kitchen. So I started to live in the kitchen, it's where I ate, it's where I slept and it became my toilet. So you can imagine the conditions after a period of time. Eventually I thought, I can't live like this anymore. I'm going to do what the voices say. I'm going to set myself on fire. Big time I should set myself on fire. But pardon the pun, I was going to go out in a blaze of glory. So I covered myself in petrol and I walked into the day centre to set myself on fire. Now you find out who your friends are. When you smell a petrol, you're a non-smoker and you ask for a light. Fortunately, no one obliged. So I'm off on yet another section. And my dad rang me and he said, I'll come and see you at seven. Well, eight o'clock, he wasn't there. So the voice was saying, he's not coming. It's because you're a murderer, kill yourself. I foolishly listened to them, went to my bed bay, smashed up my razor and slashed my wrists. Just as I'd done it, my dad walked in with a nurse, so you can imagine the commotion. And he asked me why I'd done it. They patched me up and left with him. He says, why have you done it? And I said, it's your fault. Should have been here at seven. It's now turned eight. He said, but Pete, I'm in haulage. I got stuck in traffic, you know I always turn up. Now, my dad was a really big, strong, powerful man, and his next comments really shook me. He said, I've just lost your mom. I don't want to lose you. And it was a look of utter despair in his face. It made me realise, stop being a selfish so-and-so, because you're hurting other people, not just yourself. My mom and dad had done everything. So had Sally, so had Paul. There was only one person not trying, and that was me. And the reason I wasn't trying was, 10 years prior, a consultant psychiatrist had said, you will never, ever work again. That's how powerful these words have been. 
I eventually did get discharged and my divorce came through, so I felt like a lot of pressure had been taken off me. I then fell into a relationship with someone a lot younger than me and people said, you shouldn't have anything to do with her, Pete. You know, she's got an history for violence. But I've been on my own for a long time, so I thought, in for a penny, in for a pound, see how it goes. And at first, everything was okay. Then one Friday night, see, me women don't mix on a Friday, she got extremely drunk and smashed a vase in my face, put 14 stitches in my face and carved my body up like a draft board. And that went to Crown Court and Sally came with me. And we came out of Crown Court and she said to me, how are you? I said, I'm glad it's over, Sal. She said, I didn't ask you that. I said, how are you? I said, I'm all right. She said, how are your voices? I said, well, they're there, but I'm coping. She says, you've just reached the biggest turning point in your life. She says, any other time this amount of stress would put you in hospital, you've got to build on this. And I said, well, I don't know what to do, Sal. She said, look, there's a bar across the road. And if you have to sit in there and get pissed, you are not leaving until you decide what you're going to do. So you can imagine I dragged that conversation out as long as I could. <laughs> And eventually she said, did you know the Hearing Voices groups closed at mine? So I says, no. She says, I want you to start another one. I said, I'm not interested. She says, well, let's get you interested, Pete. Let's do it together. Let's do it on support and education. So we set this group up, and we've now been with it for 17 years. It's the longest running one in the country. But at that time, I was still struggling with my own experiences. I remembered the Hearing Voices network from years before, and I managed to track them down. And a lady said, go and buy a book called Accepting Voices by Marius Rom and Sondra Escher. And to me, that, at that point, that was the most inspiring book I'd ever read. I then invited the network to Sheffield to do a workshop. I thought we can raise some money and raise our profile. And I was talking to the main speaker at the end. Now, all this guy knew about me. He knew I was a voice seer. He knew nothing else. And I said to him, I like the way you work with voices. But you're talking about voices with identities. Mine have no identity. They have no gender. They're demonic. And he just looked me straight in the face and he said, Peter, address the demons of your past. Now, the demons of my past was my abuser. And as a grown man, when I saw her, I was still running away. So I decided somehow I got to address these demons. And I saw a Saturday afternoon coming down the road. And my first instinct was to run. But I didn't. I kept walking. My heart was really pounding. But I kept eye contact all the way. And as I got close to her, she wouldn't look me in the face. She looked to the floor. And I suddenly thought, perhaps I could still get this woman in a lot of trouble. But just by getting her to look away, I'd altered the power relationship. Because you have to remember in life, no one can ever, ever give you any power. You have to take power. So I'd taken the power back from this woman, then I suddenly thought, so what? Big deal. I've got to use it. So I contacted my children and I says, please don't contact me for a couple of weeks. It's something I need to do. And I started listening more intently to the voices. And they were always talking about the abuse. And I suddenly realised the reason they're talking about this abuse is because I am blunted emotionally. When my abuse started at five, I took that fear, I put it in the box. You know the can of worms never open it? Absolute shite, you have got to open it because it comes back and it bites you on the arse. I was seeing it through a child's eyes and I suddenly realised these voices are talking about things in my life that I have not dealt with. Voices talk in metaphors. They won't say, Pete, get some counselling for your voices, mate. They'll talk about things that the abuser said and set you up. It shows you're stuck. That's the area of your life you need to work in. The problem is when we start looking around childhood trauma and abuse, because we're now at epidemic proportions, it is not one dimensional. It's layered. You've got fear, guilt, anger, shame, confusion, and you've also got pleasure. You might not want it, but your body tells you it's nice and that screws your head like you have never known. But for me, that was the biggie. I hated my abuse, but I enjoyed it. Can you ever get your head around that? So the guilt was massive. I was so guilty for what I enjoyed. So I realised somehow I got to let this guilt go. So I decided I was going to go to a court of law, but not out here, because I didn't believe I could win. In here, in my mind. So what I decided to do is I was going to go in this court of law, and I was going to weigh up the evidence for and against. My biggest fear was, what if I found myself guilty? Because I enjoyed it. How would you ever come back from that? So when I thought about it long and hard, I thought it doesn't matter. I'd actually spent time living on the streets. I slept under spare stairwells while people come and pissed on me on the way home from nightclubs. I couldn't get any lower than where I'd been. So I weighed up the evidence for and against, and I found myself not guilty and innocent of all charges because I was the child. I did not choose to be abused. And from there, I started listening more and more to the voices. And I'd always said my main voice was demonic. In reality, I knew it was my abuser. But because of the fear, I wouldn't let that voice come through. Because what we have to remember is voices are emotions. 
that become overwhelming. Now I'd faced up to my abuser in reality, I no longer feared her. So remember when working with voices, you work on the emotions, not the voice. Then I could let that voice come through and the relationship was different. The power was on my terms, not the voices. The power of the voices and the visions can only have the power that you let them have. That's the important thing. And from there, my recovery was very, very rapid. It helped me get involved more with the hearing voices more in different universities. But the message from this story is when I was in the system, the system broke me. You make no bones a bit like, about that. And the system made me weak, very, very weak. But if the weak person I became can change, then believe you me, anybody can change. Thank you for listening. Mm. Thank you.